on this slide, my title is a long, a lo quite a lot longer than what is in the program. I think uh, Dr. Wally decided I had too much to say. And, um, uh, and I could add to that conscience, which is another word that starts with C. And it's interesting that Father Taylor used um, conscience, confidence, conviction, community, compassion. So definitely the C word is in fashion at this meeting. Um, what, I'd like to start by telling you that when I opened up my email this morning, I guess you all do that every morning too, um, I saw that there was um, a, an email of one of the national newspapers in Canada, which is called the National Post. And it has a story in it, uh, which, is there a problem here? Um, it's just either closer to this or uh, oh, okay. I'll get closer to this. <laughs> or you can use this. Okay. Anyway, it has a story in it that the Quebec government is about to distribute to all doctors in Quebec uh, a euthanasia kit. And I, I could hardly... I could hardly believe it when I read what it said. It said it will contain uh, diazepam to calm the patient before, so that they're not sort of upset about this. It will contain a very strong barbiturate so that the patient will be put into a coma. And it will contain a curare derivative, I guess it will be succinylcholine, which is a muscle paralysis, which will then cause the patient to die. And it will have instructions in it how to do this with a special sheet that tells you what to do if there are, quote, complications. And, I mean, I, I, just, I just looked at this, and, oh, and the other thing it said, and there will be two full uh, sort of of these kits in this box that will be given to the doctors. I mean, it, it seems almost unbelievable. I know I've been telling you stories about Canada, but this is not the whole of Canada. This is just Quebec, which has passed an act called the End of Life Care Act. And under that, they, they purported to authorize euthanasia. Whether that is constitutionally valid is, a, is an open question, in fact. Um, so, it, I mean, it's just enormously distressing. And what I thought about was, well, what about the doctors? And there are a lot of them whose conscience says this is wrong. I, what I would suggest, and I hope this is what they'll do, is that they pack up these... They, oh, okay, they pack up these kits and send them straight back to the government. Um, but anyway, we'll have to see what is happening. So what we're dealing with here is what I call values battles in the culture wars. And I've got a book coming out in about five or six weeks where that is the subtitle of the book. And all of these battles, they're really about fundamental values issues. And respect for physicians' freedom of conscience is one of the major topics in this. And what those battles are about collectively is what are our collective values and what should they be in contemporary Western democracies. And that's a huge conflict that's sometimes called the culture wars. Now, there are two sides in this, but that is really a little bit misleading. One side you can call um, the, or they call themselves now, the progressive value side. And I'll go in a moment into what their base of values are. And the other is the um, uh, more traditionalist or conservative side, which most of us would belong to. But what you have to be careful about is those two sides are not clear cut. There can be a commonality of values across those groups. For example, um, on abortion, uh, the progressives, uh, where in terms of the feminists, are very pro-choice on abortion. In Canada, uh, they resist 
any uh, recognition in law at all, not just the restricting abortion, but even, for example, of uh, protecting a woman from being coerced into having an abortion. They, re they rejected that law. They reject now, they accept now, sorry, sex selection, which up till now most people have thought was unethical, but they don't want any law on abortion at all because they're frightened of a fetus being recognized in the law. So the, uh, the conservatives and the progressives are at odds on abortion. But then when you move to surrogacy, surrogate motherhood and assisted technologies, then the conservatives and the feminists are actually on the same page. That they, that the feminists are, but for different reasons. The feminists are against surrogacy because of exploitation of poor women, particularly in developing countries. And conservatives are against surrogacy for that reason and a whole lot more. So these, these can be, these are radically different value stances. And we need to understand the differences if we're going to make the strongest case that at least some progressive values are unwise, dangerous, wrong, unethical, and anti-democratic, and effectively rebut the claims to implement them. And that requires that we understand the arguments, strategies, tactics, rhetoric, and claims of the people who espouse progressive values. And they include the people denying physicians freedom of conscience. And really, I, I've recently come to the conclusion that the reason we lost the euthanasia debate in Canada was that we didn't fully understand enough how the other side was operating. And therefore, we weren't effective enough in stopping that. So what are the characteristics of the progressive? Well, we've heard a lot about this, but and uh, Father Taylor's uh, presentation fits right in with this, that there's an absolute priority to individualism. I call it intense individualism. You've got to be careful. Individualism used properly is not bad. We need respect for individuals. But used as intense individualism, it can do an enormous amount of harm. What that gives rise to is what you can call the informing principle of the progressives, which is choice and change. The right to choose and the desire to change. Usually it's a, it's a, cha a destructive change, wanting to destroy what's present very often without many or even any suggestions of what we need to replace that. And I just saw the other day that there's a new book out which I thought was had an interesting title because it sums up this idea of intense individualism. It's called Autonomous Motherhood, that you, you don't want to have any man involved in having a child. You want to be a single mother. And, if, and what's, I mean, what's tragic about that, in my view, is that it doesn't give any uh, credence to the rights of the child in terms of knowing who its father is. I mean, unless it's a clone, and then you get into other difficult ethical issues. So the, it, for the progressives, autonomy always, or at least almost always, takes priority over any other values. And that's why, and they want their values to be preeminent. And because they want that, that's why they want to have those values respected and implemented. And because of that, that's why they won't tolerate any conscience exceptions to their values. Because that takes away the dominance of those values as the right way for the society to be organized. Now, one, uh, one uh, action that they're doing in this regard, and this has been happening in Canada too, is that they argue that um, physicians are mere technicians. And just as it's wrong, if you take your car to a garage and the garage person says, sorry, I don't repair cars for homosexuals, for example, that's wrongful discrimination and you can't do that. And I think we all agree that's wrong. And so what they say is that physicians are technicians providing medical technical services such as abortion and euthanasia. Therefore, a physician can't say, I won't do this for you because that too is wrong. 
And what you have to realize there is that the physician is not judging the person or the person's characteristics. They're judging the procedure that is being asked for and they're denying that procedure not just to this person but to anybody who asks for that procedure. But you have to know that that's the way that you reply to that argument. And a lot of people get stuck, they don't know what to say to them. So I'm, I'm not going to say more about that because as I've, we've just seen, the, the time is very short for giving these presentations. But one of the other things that's happening, and this again is interesting, is that there's a new concept of regarding autonomy coming out of the feminist literature. And what it's called is relational autonomy. And the feminists have come to see that this in very intensely individualistic notion of autonomy can be enormously destructive. And they've started to talk about that we, as humans, we all have to live in relation. Father Taylor's community. And so they say that also has to be protected. And so they're working out this, uh, this idea that people are not just an I, I mean, amazing that they've just discovered this, that people are not just an isolated atom, but they actually live in relationship with other people. And they argue that you have to protect not just the person, but the relationship. And I think there's a lot of hope if we can join in and help them to develop that. Now, another thing about the, I'm going very quickly here, another thing about the uh, progressives is they totally reject uh, what, what they call history, the they, because they say traditional values. By the way, what they call us are the restrictives. We're the restrictives. And I recently heard a Supreme Court of Canada judge refer to as a restrictive judge, a restrictive as a judge. And so it's a very damning uh, concept. But they, and they see history and anything traditional as inhibiting your right to exercise your right of self-determination and autonomy. Now, I use uh, John Ralston Saul in his book, The Unconscious Civilization, use the word human memory for history. And I think that's a very rich concept that we're not just saying, well, this is what happened in the past. We're rather saying this is what human memory has handed down to us. And I think this fits as well for people with oral traditions. And, that that, and it shows the importance of those oral traditions and the values that those oral traditions can communicate. And the main thing in the human history in relation to conscience is, that we, as we've heard already, the Hippocratic Oath. I mean, this idea that you, mu you know, a physician must not kill his or her patient. We are now overturning that. The physicians are getting a euthanasia kit from the government to, to do exactly that, to kill their patients. Now, the next value that they have is tolerance. And this is your politically correct position that everybody has the right not to be offended, so you mustn't say anything that would offend somebody else. And um, they, and this also links to respect for individual autonomy. However, the tolerance extends only so far as you agree with the progressives. And they are not at all tolerant of your having different values and asking to um, uh, be at, le at the very least be able to speak about those values. I mean, one of the problems is in universities, and again, there's a chapter in my new book on this, is academic freedom really free? Uh, our universities, which should be our most open forum where we can debate these issues, are becoming, or have become in North America, incredibly what we call politically correct. That is, you are not allowed to say certain things. They are just not tolerated. And a lot of the statements that you might want to make, such as that, I mean, I had to have bodyguards because I said I believed that all children needed a mother and a father, which seems a pretty ordinary statement. But I was against same-sex marriage, and for that reason I got into tremendous trouble. I had a group of students at McGill Law School, which is one of the faculties where I'm appointed, 
they are the gay, society, gay and lesbian society of the law school. They're called Outlaw, they're the Outlaw group. And they got up a petition to have the law students sign it that none of them would enroll for any of my classes. So, you know, there can be a, there can be a lot of pressure put on people n not to have these beliefs. Um, I came across a statement the other day, and it was Aristotle's warning, and he said, tolerance is the last virtue of a dying society. And I thought that that merited contemplation. <laughs> now, another value is this, and I think we really have to understand this. Uh, it's control, which links to autonomy, and it's the relief of suffering. And indeed, what we know is that suffering is the, a sense of your own disintegration and a loss of control over what happens to you. So to, to the extent that you can give people back a feeling of control, and this is very important in the context of dying people, then you actually are implementing a suffering reduction mechanism. And um, there's some interesting... Uh, social psychology that shows that uh, taking control can be what the psychologists call a terror reduction mechanism or a terror management device. So one of the thoughts that I've had, and I hear we're not talking about terror risk, we're talking about being intensely afraid. And if you're intensely afraid of death, then what, and if you've got no other way of managing it, then you could see euthanasia as a means of taking control, as a means of reducing your fear of death because you've taken control. And therefore, it's, you can't get rid of it, it's, but you can get it before it gets you. And I, I think that the big problem that we have in arguing against euthanasia is that without religion, it is extraordinarily difficult to justify suffering. And I, get, I was teaching a class to graduate law students, and um, there were 40 students in the class, and I asked them who thought there was any problem at all with euthanasia. One out of 40 students put up their hand and thought that euthanasia probably wasn't a good idea. So I went back to my office in a state of shock and I thought, well, I must have done a terrible job teaching these students. So I wrote an email to all of them, and I said, look, I'm really upset that you didn't see any problem, and I'd like to know what it was that I didn't do that at least made you think there could be a problem. And I got a lot of interesting replies, but one of the most interesting was from a young woman, and she said, she said, look, the problem is, she said, that we see suffering as the greatest evil. So anything that will reduce suffering, we see, even if we see it's got problems, we see it as a lesser evil. And so we think, and we see euthanasia as reducing suffering, and therefore that's why we think that euthanasia is acceptable. So somehow, I mean, first of all, we've got to have fully available palliative care, including absolute pain management. I don't know how many of you know about the Declaration of Montreal, which establishes that it's the breach of fundamental human rights for a healthcare professional to leave somebody, unreasonably leave somebody in serious pain. That was passed in uh, September 2010. The World Health Organization has adopted it and the World Medical Association has adopted a version of it. So we have to be very, very clear that we've got a primary obligation to relieve its pain and to the extent that we're able to relieve suffering. And the, w the reality is that it's hard to deal with suffering without being able to find some meaning in it. And people who haven't got religion through which they can find meaning in suffering have got a very, very difficult task in this respect. However, it is not impossible. So, now, another feature is hostility to religion and to... Um, to under, first of all, the progressives argue 
that religion has got no place in the public square. Is there a problem? Oh, anyway, I've got a loud voice. You can probably hear me. I hope you can hear me. Oh, okay. Anyway, the, the, these people argue religion has got no place in the public square. So, I disagree with that entirely. I think we need both religious views and secular views, and the absence of either impoverishes our discussion in the public square. But to the extent that we can finesse that argument, I think we should do so. And the secret to doing that is to be very careful in the language that you choose to use. Language is the tool of all of these battles. And so I suggest to people, don't talk about sanctity of life, because sanctity immediately evokes religious connotations and associations. Talk about respect for life, fundamental respect for life, deep respect for life, and what does that require? And talk about any society in which reasonable people would want to live have to have a governing principle of respect for life. And what you'll find is that a lot more people agree with you. In the report that, the, that this current distribution of euthanasia kits is based on, that through the, the report gave rise to legislation which is now being implemented through these euthanasia kits, the uh, Quebec Expert Committee expressly rejected sanctity of life as a relevant value. They said that sanctity of life was connected with religion, that Quebec was no longer a religious society, that it was passé and it was, it was not uh, acceptable to introduce religious values in a secular society. So let's at least be clever about how we deal with that. Um, and also, I think that the other thing that we've got to see is how, um, how these people see religion. And I've got a couple of quotes. I've got a long paper here that I wrote because I thought I was going to have time to present it to you, but I won't. But for example, um, <laughs> Professor Roger Treat, who's the academic director of the Centre for the, Centre for the Study of Religion at, o at Keller College in Oxford, said um, the religious viewpoints are not even accommodated. European authorities see religion as a threat that must be controlled. Well, of course, IS is not helping with that. Uh, what's developing <coughs> is not neutrality, but hostility to religion with an ideology of human rights taking its place. And so, and then we see Bishop Michael Nazir, former <laughs> Anglican Archbishop of Rochester in England. He warned that aggressive secularism is leading to encroaching totalitarianism that's become a threat to the freedom of conscience. And these are valid and prescient warnings. And what we can see is that the progressive values people, and this is very dominant in Canada, are using human rights rhetoric mechanisms and institutions to promote their values and deny freedom of conscience to those with conflicting values. And um, I, I think that what we have to do is we've got to see that we can use those human rights institutions to promote the values that we would like to see promoted. I've just been invited to be on a group to advise the new uh, Federal Commissioner of Human Rights in Canada on what she should do for the next seven years. And my first reaction was to refuse to participate. And I said, it's no use, because I said, you're not going to agree with anything that I say. And they said, well, that's why we want you here. So, <laughs> so, uh, I, th and, and so I thought, well, OK, I'll, I'll give it a go and see what happens. But um, anyway, um, and what you have to realize that a lot of these challenges to values they are not random examples. I mean, in Canada, we've got, we've got, for example, feminists who are deliberately identifying physicians who have notices in their surgery, we do not do abortions or we do not prescribe contraceptives, and they are deliberately going to those people, getting a refusal, and then going straight to the Human Rights Commission and laying a, a claim under the human rights legislation that my human rights have been breached. So that is, that's the situation that we're in. 
Now, this is another one. I mean, I'm getting so tired of having to identify what's being done, but I think it's important that you understand they're co-opting compassion and kindness. The, um, the morning after the uh, Carter case came down in Canada, that was where the Supreme Court of Canada said it was unconstitutional to prohibit euthanasia. The front page of our major national newspaper, which is the Globe and Mail, the whole front page had a photograph of a, it looked like an old man in a wheelchair, and someone with their back to you, and the man's back with you was wheeling the wheelchair um, down this long corridor, and the only words on the front page, right across sort of about a third of the way up the photograph, were towards kindness. Towards kindness. And that's how, that was how they introduced the legalization of euthanasia. I'd like to read you the first paragraph of the judgment in the Carter case. This is the Supreme Court of Canada. It's a crime. This is here we here we is what the, and the judges, as is normal, didn't give a major, just a majority opinion, or didn't give separate concurring opinions, or even a dissenting opinion. They spoke, and this is rarely, rarely done. They spoke as the court, and that is meant to indicate this is the most serious of our judgments and we are totally, absolutely unanimous about it. And here's the first paragraph. It's a crime in Canada to assist another person in ending her own life. As a result, people who are grievously and irremediably ill cannot seek a physician's assistance in dying and may be condemned to a life of severe and intolerable suffering. A person facing this prospect has two options. She can take her own life prematurely, often by violent or dangerous means, or she can suffer until she dies from natural causes. The choice is cruel. And then they go on in another, I've forgotten how many pages it is, but an extremely lengthy judgment to set out why the choice is cruel. By the way, what they held about the right to life is astonishing. They held this in order to come to the conclusion that euthanasia was required. They held the right to life. In our, in our Canadian Charter of uh, Values, or it's the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms is its proper name, uh, we've got the right to life, liberty, and security of the person. The Supreme Court of Canada in the euthanasia case held that all three rights were breached. Now it seems a bit mind-boggling at first, how could you breach the right to life by killing somebody? Which, and what they held was that in denying people access to euthanasia, they would have to commit suicide earlier while they were still able to do it by themselves without assistance and that meant that their life was shortened because if they could wait and have somebody else kill them later on, that was an extension of the right to life. Therefore, to deny that was actually a breach of the right to life. I know, it's absolutely, totally <laughs> mind-boggling, but that's, that's what was held. So, and then finally, and we heard something about this, and all of these factors linked together the questioning authority is related to the hostility to religion, it's related to the individual autonomy, and all of that, this is a big package. It's not as simple as the pieces I've pulled out for you. But I do think we haven't in the past sufficiently identified what the, what the situation is and therefore why it's very important that we understand that. Now, I'm not going to go into this. There's a book by Jonathan Haidt called The Righteous Mind. I don't, and it's about why conservatives and liberals disagree with each other. It's an excellent work about experimental psychology where they're working out what the basis of. I have some good news for you. What that? That was the next speaker has just emailed to say she's stuck at Rome Airport waiting for her baggage, and she's very sorry she's. Terrific. 
<laughs> thank you, thank you, Rob. Um, so anyway, um, what they, they found is really worth looking at again to get a deep understanding again of why, how is it that we're disagreeing so strongly. Um, but what I, want to, um, what I want to suggest to you is this thing that I've got there, recovering the sacred. Now, what I've, I got into terrible trouble for this. Um, I've suggested that there are two kinds of sacred. For religious people, there's a religious sacred, and for secular people, I am arguing that they need a, what I've called a secular sacred, and that we all need a sacred, whichever of those two it is. And what I mean by sacred is that there are some things to which we must not lay waste. There are some things that we have to hold on, trust, to hand on to future generations. And I'm particularly talking about certain values. Now, when I first suggested this in 2001, I got into terrible trouble. I had all the religious people come down on me like a ton of bricks. And they said, you're denigrating the sacred. There can be no such thing as a secular sacred. And they were furious. And then I had all the secular people absolutely furious with me because they said, you're trying to impose religion on us and we're not going to have any of that. And one of my students, because I was telling my students, I sort of share these adventures I have with them. And I'm telling them, and one of my students said, you know Professor Somerville, he said, when you've got everybody mad at you, maybe you're onto something important. <laughs> so <laughs> I've sort of traveled on that thinking maybe. But I really think that, uh, that one of the problems is uh, this loss of any sense of the sacred, that we think that the, the, the people who have lost religion think, well, there's no longer anything sacred for us. And I think that they can recover that. Um, I was doing a television program a few weeks ago, and the, and the person interviewing me is quite a famous presenter in Canada, and she's of Japanese descent, her name's Matsumi Takahishi, and uh, she, um, just before we went on air, she wanted me to talk about euthanasia because it was about this powder case that had come down. And just before we went on air, she said, I particularly want to talk about this idea you have that there's a mystery in life and we've got to hold that on trust. And I said, but Ms. Mitsumi, I said, you're an atheist. I said, you don't believe there's any mystery in life. She said, of course I do. What are you talking about? So I think that there are things there that we can contact if we do it in the right way. We can't do it by quoting scripture at these people or telling them unless they join a church that they, they're not going to have a sacred. So um, that's what, I think that's one of the big challenges. And why that's there is because one of the differences that Haidt and his colleagues found between the liberals and the conservatives were that the conservatives had a sense of the sacred. Even if they weren't religious, they had a sense of the sacred. And the liberals didn't. They didn't have that at all. It was totally absent. So I think a big task is to try to work out how we should bring that back. Now, despite Rob's um, permission, I, I'm going to go quite quickly here. We've had a, quite a bit on abortion. I've told you that there's... Um, no law restricting abortion at all in Canada. In fact, um, abortion is a source of major conflict on university campuses. Um, there's an emerging and strengthening pro-life movement among university students. And what the statistics are showing is that medical students uh, are less and less comfortable with abortion and more of them are becoming uh, pro-life. We're also finding that this generation, the millennials, are more conservative in their values than their parents are. So they're more likely to be against abortion than their parents are. And uh, this movement is, is very strong, and, uh, but they've had terrible trouble. Uh, this is, for example, at some of our universities, the University of Calgary was one of them, four of the students got suspended for having uh, putting up a pro-life demonstration. 
uh, on the campus, which they had permission to do, but only if they turned all the posters that they had inwards so that nobody could see them unless they actually walked into the space that the posters made. And the students put up the posters and turned them outwards, at which they promptly got arrested and charged with trespass on the university. And then we've got, a, we've got groups of excellent young lawyers in Canada, and um, Alex Schadenberg works with some of them, um, and they, um, they take these cases pro bono for free and they fight for the students. And we've been winning. We've been winning. We've been putting up these, these arguments that say this is wrong. This is co using human rights. This is contrary to human rights. This is contrary to the Charter. It's not freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of belief, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly. We can, we can name off a whole list of freedoms that we've got in our law, and all of them are being breached. Um, a group of Ottawa students tried to set up a debate with the pro-choice people, and um, they gave them four months' notice and asked them to give some speakers who would be on the pro-choice side of the debate. And the, um, the speakers replied quite late that they, um, that they intended picketing the event. They would not nominate anybody, and they intended picketing the event, explaining that they planned, and I'm quoting here, to represent the fact that this is not a debatable issue. Now, in a university, and, you, and something is not a debatable issue, something as controversial as abortion. So, um, what we're seeing in our universities in this area is what, no matter what our values or views, we should all be concerned by the totalitarianism. We should call it what it is. It's totalitarianism and it's fundamentalism of the pro-choice lobby. And um, so why I've given you all that background, and I just want to say a few words, particularly about physicians' freedom of conscience, is that I don't think you can understand any one of these issues in isolation. You have to put them in a total context in which they're arising, and you have to put them in relation to each other. So that is the context in which physicians' freedom of conscience and the two major issues are euthanasia and abortion and sometimes contraception. That's a context in which they are arising. And the idea is that you can force free physicians to act contrary to their conscience and what they believe, and that you can force them to do what is wrong. And this is being implemented in some countries through codes, in other countries, including the state of Victoria in Australia through legislation, um, and sometimes through um, the use of professional power that people, uh, what is happening, for example, in Ontario, which has been mentioned, and it's also now happening in Saskatchewan, another province of Canada, is that physicians who won't go along with what the colleges dictate, which is you might, you, you are allowed perhaps not to what they call participate, which means do euthanasia or do an abortion, but they make it very clear that participation does not include the duty to make what is being called an effective referral. And an effective referral, eh? Oh, you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna talk about that. Okay, you're gonna, you're gonna hear about that from Alex. So I'll leave that to Alex to explain that all to you. But it's, it's, very, it's very important because as was mentioned, and I can't remember, it might have been my senior's talk this morning, there's punishment for people, very severe punishment. I mean, to the extent that um, one of these people in um, Ontario, who's, who was one of the drafters of this code, said, well, if anybody doesn't want to do these things, they shouldn't be a family physician, and maybe they should get out of medicine. So, I mean, it's a horrible thing. Um, uh, a colleague of ours called Sean Murphy, who works for the Protection of Conscience Project in Canada, he called it the de-ethicalization of the medical profession. And he called it ethical cleansing, getting rid of anybody who was, was um, eth ethical in that respect. 
So it's a, it's, a, it's a really, really tough situation. What I have suggested, and you know, my suggestions don't always go down very well, but the possibly the only way we can manage this at the moment would be to allow two lists of physicians and, and make those lists public. And one list would be physicians who say, I am not willing to do these procedures. And another list is the physicians who say, I will do these procedures. And then you can choose according to which list. That I don't, I personally, I don't want to go to a physician who is willing to give euthanasia to somebody. I don't want that physician looking after me. And so I think, I think you can argue that from the point of view of patients' rights, that patients have got a right to have that choice. I would also argue, and this is very important for Catholic institutions, that we need to be able to have what I would call euthanasia-free zones or physician-assisted suicide free zones that where you know that there's an institution where you can't do this. This Quebec legislation I mentioned is incredibly broad. Um, it allows euthanasia in a person's home, in a nursing home, in a residence, in an institution, in a hospital. It's right across the board. Moreover, very interestingly, the Quebec, um, the Quebec society, and or this is what the committee alleges, rejected assisted suicide. So it's not at all clear that the legislation covers assisted suicide, although probably it does, but they endorsed euthanasia. <coughs> so they obviously, for some reason, they were, whether it was that in accepting suicide as a valid response to suffering, you've got a problem with your anti-suicide movements. But anyway, Quebec said you can have euthanasia, but you can't, you, can't, you know, suicide's more, more sort of uh, doubtful, to put it. So anyway, that's the consequences which I've mentioned. And that, this is what Alex is going to talk about, so we won't do that. Um, now, though, this, I think this point is, is important, that progressives are not content to act with... Um, to, uh, to, to be able to do what they want to do, they want to make everybody else do it too. And the reason for that is that um, they, want, they want public affirmation that their values should predominate as the societal norms. And as I said, that's why they won't respect the freedom of conscience exception, because that says, well, no, this is not... This is not the societal norm. Not everybody accepts it. Not everybody has to abide by it. So um, it's an extraordinary example of intolerance for freedom of conscience. Oh, yeah, there's just one other thing I want to... If you want to know how far this has gone in Canada, we have a federal... Uh, you are all going to go home thinking Canada's a den of iniquity, I know. It's actually not, but it's really gone off the tracks in terms of values at the moment. But we have a federal election coming up on the 17th of October. And the leader of the Liberal Party, which is, regards itself and is often be regarded by Canadians as what is called in Canada the natural governing party, the, and so it's got, it's got a chance of getting elected again. It, it's been in power for most of the last half century. Um, anyway, uh, their new leader, who is Justin Trudeau, the son of the former very famous Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau, uh, about three or four months ago, when, the, when it was becoming obvious that we were going to have a federal election and, they, and the parties had to choose who would be their representatives in each of the ridings that will vote for a representative, he came out and he said that nobody could stand to be a, a, a representative of the Liberal Party unless they were totally pro-choice on abortion. You were not allowed to stand as a potential politician. And the first time he said it, he also said that any member of the Liberal Party, that's just your ordinary grassroots people, they also had to be pro-choice, but then he must have been told by his handlers, well, there's going to be a lot of people who won't be members of the Liberal Party. So he, re he rescinded on the members, but all of the, all of the people standing for election have to be pro-choice. It's not a matter of conscience. So, 
So what you, what I argue there, when I use the word anti-democratic at the beginning, what I'm arguing there is that this is anti-democratic because in a representative democracy, the basis of representative democracy is you elect somebody that you hope will stand for your most important values and needs and desires. And so if you, if, you're, if somebody is being elected when they've already been told this is how you have to think, you are not going to represent your constituents' views, you're going to represent the party's views, I think there's a, a huge breach of rights and obligations in doing that. So, there we are. Now, yeah, a woman, a woman, a prestigious, a woman from a very prestigious Canadian family who were huge supporters of the Liberal Party, including financially. The day after this came out, she wrote me an email saying, she only knows me as a public figure, but she wrote me an email saying, can't you do something about this? And I said, no, I don't know if I can. And uh, the letter was signed with her name, and underneath it had card-carrying Liberal member until yesterday. <laughs> so he definitely, anyway. So the other thing I'd like to point out, and this has also been raised, that we know that it can take a great deal of courage to follow one's conscience when doing so creates a serious risk to yourself. And even more so, I think, to those one loves, that kids at school can suffer from this. And a lot of people, I think, are not willing to take the risk because of that. And so I think I'm in a, privilege, in, a, in a sense, a privileged position in that regard, in that I don't have a partner or any children. So whatever I do only impacts on me. But I can see how it can be terribly difficult for other people. And um, yet it's extraordinarily important that you stand up for important values in medicine. Because medicine is now the prime forum in, w in democratic Western societies for creating, affirming, challenging, and destroying shared values. And the reason for that is that there's no other forum to which everyone, every single person in a society, personally relates. But they do to medicine because they know they will need it or those they love will need it. So, do you want me to stop? Yeah. Can I just do the oh, conclusion? Oh, please, uh, conclude and then we'll have a few minutes of questions. Okay, I'm not, gonna, I, I'm not gonna tell you the Lemmings story, but there's a great Lemmings story that I'd love oh. to tell you. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> maybe in the question period. If somebody wants to know about the Lemmings in the question period, I'll tell you about it, okay? So in conclusion, there are valuable lessons to be learned from some of the arguments and positions espoused by the progressives I call them permissives, uh, <laughs> values advocates. But if their claims are not balanced by those of people with countervailing values, the result will eventually prove to be an ethical disaster for our societies. The progressives, permissives, advocates are values deconstructionists, often without viable replacements to offer. Their stance is accurately described, as it was recently by Pope Francis, as adolescent progressivism. It's often also utopian totalitarianism. They see themselves as creating a better world and is entitled to impose their values, even at great cost to those who disagree with them, in order to achieve the goal that their values dominate. This attitude brings to mind an old saying in human rights, Nowhere are human rights more threatened than when we act purporting to do only good. Sole focus on the good we hope to achieve can blind us to the risks and harms unavoidably also present. I believe I've touched on all of the concepts or institutions in my title, courts, codes, conscience, complicity, cruelty, compassion, and control, and I hope that I've communicated to you some of the lessons from Canada which you must find useful in trying to respect, protect, and uphold the very important value in medicine, physicians' and nurses' freedom of conscience. Thank you.
um, I have one question and one comment. Um, about um, the question about uh, secular, sacred, would you consider the word transcendence? Would that be an easier word to, to digest for the secular crowd? Which is actually transcendence. So yes, but I think that we, I think we've got to have a common root of some sort. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would, I think this idea. I found that as people get used to the idea of secular sacred, they're not uncomfortable with it. Some people will remain so, but it seems it's sort of it's really calmed down once they got used to what it was. Good. The second question applies to all of both of you. It's about um, the modern concept of conscience seems, I think, has its root in that it's not something deep inside you, but something that you acquire and you put on. It's almost like something you can put on, you can, you can take off. So it's kind of like a, like what you said, no, a, a taxi or... I might turn that off, I'm sorry. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's something that you, is not part of you, but something that you acquire, so you can also or go, no? I think that's the problem with that concept of conscience. I think it's probably from John Locke or from... Um, yeah, well, I'd like to refer to what Father Taylor said. An another big theme in my work, which is very unpopular with the progressives, which usually means you're being successful, um, is that we've got multiple ways of human knowing. And that reason is only one of those ways. It's important, but I actually happen to believe that reason is not a primary way of knowing. I believe it's a secondary verification mechanism and that our primary ways are, are intuition, especially moral intuition, what I call examined emotions, human memory. History is a human way of knowing and there's a whole lot of others. And uh, I, I think we, you know, we have to recover those and they all... Move, help you to move into this idea of sacred and transcendence. Yes, about the, the concept of conscience as something that is not deep in you. Well, no, I, yeah. you see, with those, with those integral human yeah. ways of knowing, yeah. I would think conscience okay. is what comes out yeah. of the proper balanced uh, use of those ways of knowing. That if you look, we have in ethics, as you know, um, we have what we call the ethical yuck reaction. That when you, fir you first hear of something, you've got no idea why you, you do it, but you say yuck. And, and what we now do is we say to people, well, you've got to unpack that. Why did you say yuck? What is wrong there? And of course, what I mean, like three parent babies mm -hmm. was a good example of this. Everybody said yuck. Altering the human germline is another example. Right, but those yuck factors could diminish as time goes on. Like 50 years yeah. ago, you say homosexual marriage, you say yuck. But yeah. now, 50 years later, it's Yeah, like, I know. But that's also... We yeah, have to be careful yeah. about that. Yeah. Father Tam and I have had prior encounters. <laughs> <laughs> He lived conscience in a context so that it wasn't a purely individual thing. And by citing Augustine, the Securus Judica at Augustorarum, he was saying your conscience is clearly, oh, sorry, yes. your, your conscience is formed in context. And so by taking the Aristotelian approach of phronesis also, that context is foundational, so that your conscience is a very social concern. And when you're in the ecclesial context, this is the marvelous business of sharing your values in a context where those values are lived, where they are effectively supported. So magisterium for Newman wasn't an enormous bother, it was an enormous help. 
because the magisterium was not imposing, it was defending the tradition. So that there's a whole, the idea of, of history. When we're talking about history, we're talking about the lived experience of the faith, and that's tradition. Now, if you give a very bad approach to tradition, then it becomes a kind of an imposition of authority from the past. If you give the proper understanding of tradition, it is the values from the past being effectively maintained, improved, and developed, and secured. And that is the way in which the doctrine would have developed. Now, you can see that, in, a, in small ways, that your conscience as the idea we become good by being with good people. So the total meaning of your life is associated with your stance towards life. So your conscience belongs there. It isn't a question of making an appeal to a new set of reasons that we brought in from somewhere. It is the lived experience of goodness. And the conscience is associated with the practical experience of making the right decision with regard to what is now in front of us with the security that you are doing it in the tradition that also sustains that particular approach. So I think that this has been badly misconstrued, but I'm, I'm just hoping that when people would see a lived experience of it, like Newman, with his different conversions, going from one to the other all the time, until ultimately he would be able to say, not that he had seen everything right, he didn't. On his tomb was written, ex imaginibus et umbris in veritatum, out of shadows and images into the truth, because the total truth is only known in heaven. So while we're making our way here, they are shadows and images, but they're not empty. And so you can see the idea, therefore, that when you're working in the context of people who help us all the time to be good, then our security is effectively underwritten. So I think this is extremely important. By the way, with regard to moral philosophy at the present time, there is a whole new approach that um, where the philosophy of religion, for instance, things that have been undervalued, valued, like poetry, right, like music, like art, why were these underplayed? Why were these second order? But you ask the question of transcendence. It's a difficult word, but normally it evokes the idea of going on the particular, the nameable, the identifiable, and therefore, in a sense, the controllable. No, it goes into a much different, what, like what happens to you when you're listening to Mozart's um, 22nd, you know what I mean? Why are you given this extraordinary experience? And if Neurologists and people want to say, well, it's just a subjective experience. You say, well, thanks very much. All you've done now is destroyed something or try to destroy something, which is simply not a true description of what is going on. How is it there's a sort of a musical tradition? There is. And there's all the difference between Mozart mania and Mozart. <laughs> 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 well, you get the idea. On that note, so the mind may have.